Hey everyone, thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. We got a very special episode. We got Grant Kemp coming in from Dallas. Is that What's right? Up? Yeah, from Dallas. Uh, and he's with creativecashflow.com and he's here to share how he's increased his conversion rate by adding creative financing to his business. If this is your first time tuning in, I'm Steve Trang, broker owner of Stunning Homes Realty, founder of the Offer Fast Homes app, the only MLS for off market wholesale properties. And I'm on a mission to create 100 millionaires. So if that's something you're interested in, let's definitely connect on Instagram. Uh, and I do have an announcement at the end of today's show. There will be free shirts involved, so don't tune out. Um, and if you're excited for today's show, please give me a wave, give me a thumbs up. And as a friendly reminder, I don't charge a dime for this show. I don't make any money doing this. So here's all I ask. This is what it costs for you to listen to this show. If you get value today, please tell a friend. You can share the episode right now, tag a friend below, or tell them your best takeaway from the show later on. That way we can all grow together. And don't forget, this is a live show, so please post your questions for Grant to answer. Are you ready? I'm super ready. All right, awesome. <laughs> so how did you get into real estate? Um, so my my story is somewhat shared with a lot of folks that I'm sure are listening here, which is that I don't come from money. I didn't. Nobody in my family has money. Um, and so when I was getting into the real estate side of things, you know, my Google search of what I needed to do was like, how do you make money in real estate when you have no money, right? Like, <laughs> what do you do? And obviously a lot of people choose to go into wholesaling uh, for that reason, not having the capital, but I really gravitated. I was super attracted by the seller financing side of things, subject to and, and creative strategies. It's really kind of clicked something in my brain. So, um, so yeah, that's just kind of what I uh, what I did. So our first our my first purchase of a home ever was with my wife. We bought a duplex. I've come to find that's called house hacking, where you live in half and rent half, kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and then one beautiful night, we actually became really good friends with our tenant on the other side. One beautiful night, my tenant uttered the the words that we all love to hear, which were, "I'm just ready to let my other house go back to the bank." <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, I know this trigger word." So I bought her house sub two. That was my first actual like investment investment property. I bought that sub two, flipped it out as a uh, as a wrap. Um, I netted about eight grand on the down payment, and I made about three hundred and seventy five dollars a month uh, mm -hmm. on cash flow from that. And the beautiful thing about that is when you're doing creative financing, we're the, we're the bank. We don't have tenants, toilets, and trash. So that's a right. true, like, that 375 was a net number. That's not a gross number that you have to take expenditures out of or anything like that. So I got started there. Uh, make a long story long, just kind of, you know, hit the ground running, quit my job, said my, my job is getting in the way of me making more money in real estate. Uh, so I quit my job after only having done three deals, uh, which is not what I recommend. But, you know, hey, jump in the net will appear. Within the first uh, uh, 12 months, I was I was consistently buying seven or eight properties a, a month, uh, mm -hmm. subject to, and uh, just kind of took off from there. Ended up opening up Texas Pride Lending, which did the origination and the RMLO work, all the compliance stuff for seller mm -hmm. financing. We grew that to be the largest RMLO operation in the nation within two years, and I sold that company, and here we are. Now, I'm, I realized I owned a brokerage. I wasn't an investor anymore. And so I, I uh, got back into the investing side. Now I do the training side. And there's my story in a way too long nutshell. So when did you jump in? Like when did you start doing sub two? So I, my first, so I quit my job to go full time uh, November of 2012. Okay. And so I had done my first deals uh, at, the, at the beginning part of that year and part of 11. Okay. So, end of 2011, 2012, hmm, our Facebook feed looks kind of funny. Uh, hopefully that's not affecting everybody. Um, okay, so you jump in, you, you're, you're doing searches on sub two, mm -hmm. and then you just hit the ground running. How were you finding your sub twos, like when yeah. you first started? <clears throat> so. Um, you know, it's funny. I look at, uh, uh, I actually found, so I moved offices July or something last year. So I'm, you know, fighting all of my, my crap in the, uh, in the, in the cabinets and stuff. And I found one of my very first marketing pieces with direct mail. This is the short answer of what mm -hmm. you're saying is it was direct mail, but, uh, it was funny because, you know, I, it, we've got so many people right now in Dallas and I don't know. Uh, I know Phoenix is blowing up too, and I don't know if you guys that are watching this may fall into this category, but I've got so many people that are just like, oh my gosh, like days on market are 14. I don't know what I'm gonna do. You know, like yeah. people are freaking out, like everything's falling. Oh, my house has been on the market for three weeks. And like my first marketing piece, or one of my first marketing pieces I had, uh, 
which, by the way, got the FBI called on me. I can tell you that story, too. But I actually had to do an FBI interview off of this piece. I put a piece of towel in an, in an envelope because I wanted them to feel it, right, and mm-hmm. open it. Lumpy mail. And, uh, yeah, and uh, and it said, you know, feeling underwater, I'm here to help you dry off. Huh? I'm super corny. Um, but it said the average days on market was six months, right? And so, it, you know, that's that kind of market is so good for creative financing in mm-hmm. sub two because when we do have that turn – Right. That's when you can just eat up properties with mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So uh, to answer your question directly, sending out direct mail, trying to touch people in as many ways that I could uh, that way through through direct marketing and uh, just taking the inbound calls and going on the appointments. And then also JVing with other wholesalers was actually really where I got my volume from um, because there's so many wholesalers that because, you know, you know, when you're buying cash, which I buy cash, too. But when you're buying cash, you got to buy at a big discount. You got to be at 70, 75 cents or whatever. Um that's not the case with creative financing. So wholesalers, we're, people like me are a great tool for wholesalers because wholesalers, if your buyer or if your seller owes too much or or uh, uh, is requiring too high of a price, mm-hmm. you can't move. But somebody like me can move. And so I, I started partnering with a lot of wholesalers, uh, working their dead leads. That way, you know, my, my phrase was this way you can pay for your marketing campaign out of your trash can. Right. And uh, uh, so that's really where I got my volume from was JVing with other people who were not able to close the types of deals that we can and sending out direct, uh, direct mail marketing. Gotcha. So what were some of your early struggles then? Um, not having money, any money and not having any knowledge and just having to grow both of them at the same time. I, uh, my, I, I'm not exaggerating. This is not a, uh, people will think I cool. I'm cool. If I say this kind of phrase, which I think people hear guys like us say these things and they just automatically, they're like, Oh yeah, that's the story that people tell. I legitimately averaged 15 hours a day for the first, uh, 18 to 20 months of my career, seven days a week. I was literally showing houses Christmas morning. Um, because to be successful in this business, you've got to either have, uh, time, knowledge or money, Mm -hmm. right? So I didn't have money. (laughs) I was gaining knowledge. What I had to leverage to make money in this business was my time. And Mm -hmm. so I had to hustle the crap out of it and make that happen. So that was a struggle, um, of just handling life when you're working that hard constantly and and trying to figure all the things out and make all the right connections. So when you're talking about showing houses, what is that about? So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll buy a house sub two and then sell it as a wrap mortgage, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, this one Christmas in particular, you know, I had two or three houses l- that were available. And um, um, and and literally I had a, uh, uh, a buyer with twenty or $25,000 down um, and they wanted to look at houses on Christmas morning. And I'm like, okay, you know, you do what it takes, right? Like (laughs) that's, that's what's going to go on. So I was showing those houses and, you know, made the sale and, and got some money out of it. And so that was good. But, um, so you, you quit your job. What was you, what what were you doing? Um, it, I I did automation for a uh, stock company. Okay. So you quit your job and you're doing this and you're running as a one man show Mm -hmm. for how long? Um, not very. So I've, man, I've been so blessed. God's opened so many doors for me in so many ways. So there's a, there's a, an attorney out of, uh, um, Dallas that his name's Scott Horn. He's kind of the preeminent Texas attorney for creative financing. So, um, when I was, I think uh, I met him. Have you? I think I met him as strategic coach. Oh, really? Santa Monica. Um, I doubt it. He's not a big traveler, uh, in the times that I've known I'll have to look back. Okay. Great, like silver gray hair, kind yeah. of short. Really? Okay, yeah. yeah. Super great guy. I mean, the dude is just freaking brilliant. He really yeah. is. Um, but as I was doing my, like, how do you make money with no money searches and, like, you know, creative financing pops up and I'm like, oh, sub too. And I'm trying to figure that out. And so I'm on bigger pockets trying to figure, and just time and time and time and time and time and time again, everybody's like, dude, you got to talk to this Scott Horn guy. <clears throat> so I bugged the crap out of him for mm-hmm. uh, months and uh, I finally got a meeting with him uh, where he allowed me to come in. And, you know, again, a, an opened door was, uh, was, I left that meeting with a key to the building and an office. Right. And so it was oh. just like, okay, let's do this, right? So he allowed me to come in and learn under him and get things going. So I was really only on my own, on my own for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. You know, when I quit my job, I uh, it was the week before Thanksgiving and uh, I spent, you know, the, <laughs> the next few weeks realizing what a stomach ulcer feels like. And, uh, and then I finally, you know, got that meeting and got in and that's where I was really able to gain some traction. So the lesson there being for anybody listening is if you want success in real estate. There are guys 
who, you know, similarly like what I just said, you know, I, I work a lot with, with wholesalers that can't, you know, get their deals done. That's how I got started was finding someone who had the yin to my yang, right? I had time to make, to make money or to make deals work. You've got to have time, knowledge and money. So I found a guy that had knowledge and money and I gave him my time and traded that to make money together, you know? So you guys were working as a partnership? Mm -hmm. Was he underneath you? Yeah, with them. Um, yeah, I, I came in and I told Scott, you work for me now, dude. <laughs> <laughs> this, this building is mine. All right. Um, yeah, no, so I came in uh, under the uh, uh, agreement of um, I'm going to bust my ass for you and, and – just please be my resource. Mm -hmm. uh, within six months, we formed an actual partnership partnership with him and another guy. We were all equal partners, 33% uh, uh, owners. The other guy ended up stealing a bunch of money from us. And so we uh, 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 let that go, but then, you know, ended up bringing somebody else in. And so yeah. we, we ran as a, a three person partnership for a few years, uh, then we ran as just me and Scott for a few years, and then uh, he and I just split last year, just because you know there's there was no longer like now I have knowledge and money and don't have time, <laughs> and mm -hmm. so like we were both the same guy, and so you know it just wasn't really a partnership that made sense. We split amicably, still close with him and stuff, but yeah, awesome. All right, so you talked about. Uh, well, let's talk about how you're finding these sub two deals mm -hmm. first. So, mm -hmm. what are you doing to find these sub two deals? So, sub two deals actually are are in all of the lead sources you're already looking for. Um, it's just training your ear to understand those phrases of uh, willingness, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, basically, you're not going to sub two a probate. Um, mm -hmm. You're not as likely to sub to a VA loan. VA loans are very difficult because the seller of a VA loan wants to use that VA loan again, that typically, right? And so mm -hmm. they're they're unwilling to leave that in place for you. But every other mortgage type and every other free and clear property is a candidate for sub two or creative financing. You ever run into issue with FHA? Uh, well, so, okay, so the you can't get a title insurance policy on a government-backed loan. So uh, I say you can't get. Most title companies will not do a title insurance policy mm -hmm. on a government back. So FHA, VA, USDA. Mm -hmm. um, however, I don't get an insurance policy, a title insurance policy on any of my sub twos. Mm -hmm. um, he here's the thing. And so, you know, we can flash our like, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> we we do not represent you. Don't, you know. Yeah, where's the giant asterisk first? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. So you think about title policies, right? And and I like doing this like when I'm speaking in front of a large crowd because mm -hmm. it, it really, it really uh, uh, drives the point home. But we can do this digitally. You can digitally raise your hand for me, okay? Digitally raise your hand in some way. Uh, and how many people roundabout do we have? 30. Watching. Okay, so we got about 30 people watching. Digitally raise your hand for us, comment or whatever, if you've ever actually had to use your title policy, okay? Um, okay, and what was that claim for? Was it for under $5,000 or was it a big one? Uh, I don't even know. Title insurance just took care of it. Okay, so 99... Well, we've done a lot of transactions. Right, right. 99% um, of the time, you're never going to have to use a title insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Of that 1%, 99% of those times, the claim is for under $5,000, okay? Yeah. Title insurance policy is 1,000 bucks, mm -hmm. 1,200 bucks, maybe 800, depending on where, you know, <laughs> where your market is and, and what things cost. Um, so when you're doing volume, right? You're doing sub two, like we're buying six, seven, eight houses a month. I'm gonna round up to make myself sound cool and say 10, but that really it's just because of math. So if you're doing 10 houses a month and it's $1,000 a, a policy, right? That's a lot of money in the year, mm -hmm. right? I'm not very good at math, but it's more than 5,000 bucks. So when you're doing these large volumes, um, it's like self-insuring, right? By not getting the policy, mm -hmm. uh, yes, you're betting a little bit that you're not gonna have to make that claim, um, but we, you just really, I mean, it, it just barely ever comes up. So the thing that I'm getting at here is, um, when you when you're when you're when you're doing this business FHA and VA not being able to get insured really doesn't hinder me because mm -hmm. I wasn't going to get the policy anyway nothing says you can't sub to it right you you can still sub to the deal you're just not going to be able to get it insured policy so is Dallas or is Texas a title state or a um, or a lawyer state or an escrow uh, yeah a lawyer you can close with your lawyer office so you close with the lawyer's office mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. gotcha 
Okay. I'm just curious because, you know, there's, if you don't have title insurance, who's closing it? Because here we're a title state. Right. Right. Yeah. So you, are you required to cl close at a title company here? Uh, I don't know where we're required, but that's what's okay. done here. Right. So everybody, so most people like kind of default to closing at title companies, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is not bad. And let me be very clear too when I say that if you're going to buy a house with cash or you're going to put significant cash on the line, get the title policy. Mm -hmm. But here's the next step of me not doing title policies. When you're buying a sub two house, right? You may be taking over on a mortgage. Maybe that is sub two. <laughs> You're taking over on mortgage. They may be five or six thousand dollars behind, right? So you, you catch up five or six thousand dollars of their payments. Uh, maybe you got to put in another ten thousand dollars worth of work. So you're fifteen thousand dollars in in cash. Uh, the title policy costing a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars is ten percent of your cash output. You're paying fifteen or fifteen hundred dollars to protect fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? Um, so there's a little bit of that side of things too, where it's like you know, we've got such a low capital need in these, um, a, a ton of my deals, I'll buy sub two, they're caught up, right? And you, mm -hmm. you, you may not, you can sell it as is. You may not have any cash in the deal. Right. So to pay a thousand bucks to protect that. So you use an attorney. Yes. And they'll still record a deed transfer? Or? Of course, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we're gonna do, for sub two, uh, and, and just to kind of, unpack sub two a little bit if anybody's watching and, and, and is kind of unfamiliar with what we're talking about. Sub two is short for the phrase, I'll buy your house subject to the underlying mortgage staying in place sentences, right? right. That's, that's what that stands for. Um, meaning that essentially we're going to take over on payments and I don't ever want you to say take over on payments to the seller because it implies that they don't have any responsibility moving forward. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. Um, but a mortgage and are you a, a mortgaged or do you do a uh, note and deed of trust? And, and uh, we're a deed of trust. Okay. So we've got three policy or three documents that go into a home purchase with a loan. You've got the, the warranty deed gives you ownership of the property. Mm -hmm. The note says, Hey, you owe me a hundred thousand dollars for the next 30 years. And the deed of trust says, Hey, if you don't pay me that, I'm going to take the house back from you. Right. Right. So with subject to, we're getting deeded the property. The warranty deed is going to go to Steve Drang. Mm-hmm. But we're not going to touch the note and the deed of trust. We're mm -hmm. just going to continue making those payments on their behalf. Right. Well, I'm asking this because typically what we do with VA is we do a contract for deed. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And if you're in a state that does allow you to do contract for deed, that's great. Okay. Do contract for deed. Contract right. for deed is an excellent tool. Texas, we got contract for deed taken away from us uh, 2006. All right, you want to explain what contract for deed is? So contract for deed is essentially like you, it, it's a, uh, you'll hear rent to owns kind of lumped in there a lot of times. You're making an agreement that says, if I make you this many payments for this many years, then at the end of that, you'll give me the deed to the property. Okay. Um, it's a really, really powerful tool on the, like if you're the seller, um, it's, it's great because you're able to kind of, and, and this has changed a little bit with how Dodd-Frank goes and that kind of stuff, but mm -hmm. getting the house back is a little bit easier on a contract for deed than it is when you've actually deeded the property from day one. Right. Um, but we deed the property from day one. Yeah, I was just curious because typically the concern is by doing the deed that the note might be called, right? right? It might right. get accelerated. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's referring to the, the due on sale clause, which every mortgage has a due on sale clause, right? which says that if you sell the property or any interest of that property, uh, the bank has the option, not the obligation, to ask for the remainder of that loan mm -hmm. to be due at any point in time. But my response always is, what does the bank want? Like, what does the bank want? Payments. They want payments. They want their money. They want their interest. Mm -hmm. I, my joke is if they wanted real estate, they'd be called Caldwell Banker, not Bank of America. Right? <laughs> right? So the in, in the real world, uh, the amount of due on sale clause that actually gets called when the payments are being made and the insurance is being taken care of in the right way is extremely small, but it's a very real thing that could happen and we need to do what we can to- Have you ever had that happen to you? Um, I've had one house that may have had the due on sale clause called on it, but it was a really weird situation. It was with Wells. They just stopped accepting our payments and they wouldn't talk to us or the seller. It was very strange. So what I ended up doing is using what's called a collateral assignment or a hypothecation. I uh, uh, brought one of my private lenders in and essentially refinanced myself out of that sub two loan gotcha. uh, just to not deal with it. But uh, so maybe, right. <laughs> but I don't know. I'm not, I'm not positive if that's what was happening. Okay. And so uh, Antoine Campbell wants to know reverse loans. Can you wrap those? That's a really good question. And I have not found nor, uh, so like Scott is, is one of the most brilliant minds I know uh, in, in law and creative financing. And he and I sat down 
several sessions and we just couldn't figure out a way to really do a wrap on a reverse mortgage. That's not to say that there's not a way to do that. Why did you guys come to that conclusion? Well, it's just because, well, and, and to be perfectly honest, I don't really remember. This was, <laughs> this was years ago. I remember the conclusion. Um, wrap mortgage, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, reverse mortgages, just due to the nature of like their repayments and and how those payments are factored in the and the the situation with that seller um i can't remember the specifics of it so i don't want to bs you too hard yeah but we just couldn't do it i just well, couldn't I mean, find for me, a way. the biggest fear is that it's growing right well yeah yeah of <laughs> the balance course. is growing right so it rarely makes sense right uh for those for long term at least mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, so Cruz wants to know, uh, Jay Cruz wants to know, subject to FHA in Arizona. So knowing that, I, I don't know if you can answer this question because mm-hmm. you're from Texas. Right. Uh, if you wanted to do a subject to in Arizona on FHA, how would you structure that? Um, so, uh, you know, <clears throat> I like to deed the properties. Um, I'm working with, uh, do you know Eddie Speed? Are you familiar with him? Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he's another just brilliant notes guy. Uh, and and, and he, he and I are, are pretty close. And he's working on something right now that we're kind of kicking back and forth about using the contract for deed versus the 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 deeding from day one, going into a trust and you know that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I'll say is I'm a fan of just deeding the property. I think that it is, I think the complications that get added from using the trust and all that kind of stuff don't really outweigh the true risk that you're inheriting um, by just deeding the property and and getting it done simply. So uh, in my opinion, not knowing too much about Arizona law, I mean, if you're able to just close in an attorney's office, close at the attorney's office, get deeded the property, make sure that your disclosures are solid though. I mean, that's what the paperwork is going to, that's where people die with sub two is that they don't have good disclosures to the seller explaining what the due on sale clause is, explaining that they still have their name on the loan, that kind of stuff. So can you explain what some of those good practices are for disclosing? Uh, so those two would be big ones, right? Like the due on sale clause, like we talked about a second ago, that's huge. The seller needs to be aware because here's the thing. One of the great things about sub two is that we're buying this house into our LLC, right? So we, we have no personal liability on it. Uh, uh, we don't have to put a lot of capital out there. And we're, we're taking over on a loan that's got like 4% interest on it and 22 yeah. years left on it. Find me a private lender that's going to give you those terms, right? It's not going to happen. Right. Um, but we have to understand that that loan is staying in Mr. Seller's name. And so if these payments don't get made or if the due on sale clause gets called, it's Mr. Seller whose credit is going to get shot. Mm-hmm. It's Mr. Seller who's going to hurt from that. Now, that's a benefit for us. That's something that's advantageous because it's non-recourse on our side. It's non-recourse, uh, non-institutionalized, unlimited funding for our deals. Right. But we need to be very clear with Mr. Seller, like, hey, look, your name is staying on this loan. You need to understand that. And what that means is I'm going to continue making these payments on your behalf. That's the phrase I want you to use instead of take over on payments is mm-hmm. we're going to make these payments on your behalf. I'm going to make these payments on your behalf. Um, but your name is going to be on that mortgage and therefore it's going to show up on your credit report and it's going to remain there. And you need to be okay with this loan staying in your name for the next, for the remainder of the loan, Mm -hmm. 22 years, something like that, whatever it is. Our average is 22 to 28 years left on the loans. Um, don't mention to them that you may sell the note or that the buyer might refinance or anything like that. Because if you talk to a seller and you say, hey, you need to be okay with this loan staying in your name for the remainder of the loan, but don't worry because we might sell the note and that would pay you off or our buyer might refinance or I might refinance with that. But all they will hear is that they're gonna get paid off in mm-hmm. a year, right? And so they're gonna call you in a year and a half and say, why is this loan still in my name? You need to get it out of my name. So don't even bring that up to them. Sounds like a painful lesson. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and to that point too, Sometimes you're just going to have sellers that are going to forget that you saved their butt and helped them. Like it's, mm. they're just going to forget that. And they're going to come back a year later and say, why is this on my, and it's like, we went over this. You, you fully understood this before it, that's going to happen. That's, that's an inherent risk of that too. Right. Did I answer your question? I think I got off track. Yeah, no, it definitely did. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, were there any other questions? So, uh, how do you know what to ask for a down payment when selling these creative deals? 
So when you're selling a uh, creative financed deal to a, cre so like I like to buy with, with creative financing and sell with creative financing, uh -huh. right? So I might buy sub two. The reason why I keep using creative financing versus sub two is that we can do this with a free and clear house. We can do this with a house that has a lot of equity. We can do this with a house that has no equity, right? So there's different ways to structure all of that. It's not always going to be sub two. Uh, similarly, on the sales side, you know, we, I like to do the wraparound mortgage. So, so we're going to uh, uh, buy with sub two, let's say, sell with a wraparound. That note that I'm going to create right here on the wrap, um, that's a marketable asset. That is a great piggy bank because we may have took it, taken over on a $60,000 loan and sold it for a hundred. We had a 10% down payment. So we get 10,000 bucks right up front, which by the way, what's the average wholesale fee? 10K. 10, five, yep. right? Um, so you're making your wholesale money right up front anyway, but you're also setting up a uh, a true net cash flow, and you've got equity in the deal that becomes a piggy bank. Mm -hmm. You've got your today money and your tomorrow money all wrapped up in this single deal. That's why I'm such a big fan of the strategy. So if we sell for 100, we get 10, 10 grand up front. Well, congratulations, there's what you would have made on your wholesale fee. Now they have a note to you for $90,000. You have a note to Wells Fargo for 60. Mm -hmm. So you've got a $30,000 piggy bank sitting there. That asset is very marketable. But for that to be marketable, for that note, for somebody to wanna buy that note, they want your rap buyer to be in at a maximum of 90% LTV. Mm. So we need to ensure that we're always getting to that 90% LTV as quickly as possible with that seller, or I'm sorry, with your buyer, um, so that we can make sure that if we wanted to sell that note, we can. And so then you might sell that note for 90% of its value, 80% of its value. In this case, you'd be getting 80-ish thousand dollars from a note sale, but that's 20 more thousand dollars in your pocket if you needed to go buy a car or something, you know? <laughs> Who's buying these notes? Um, me. <laughs> uh, uh, I will buy your notes. Eddie Speed buys notes. Uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of note buyers. The note mm -hmm. space is huge. Uh, there's a lot of people looking for that because if you have, and, and by the way, if you are watching this or listening to this and you have money and you don't necessarily have time, the note space is an excellent space to be in because you can get the returns you're looking for, the yields that you're looking for off of off of note purchases because you're buying at a discount. Uh, even though my mortgage might be for nine and a half percent, you might be getting a 11 yield on mm -hmm. that, right? So um, uh, that's a little uh, off track, but there's all kinds of note buyers. It's a whole world of people that are, that are going on uh, doing yeah. these. Maybe we'll hit that towards the end of the show. Uh, so cool. when you're talking about finding these properties, mm -hmm. right? So let's say someone's listening to the show right now. Yeah and they want to go start going after subject two, uh -huh. what three things should they be doing right now to go find subject two deals? So we all know that direct mail is not what it used to be, mm -hmm. right? But it still is there. I think that there's value in understanding that whereas we used to be able to rely on five-ish percent return rates on our yellow letters now, that's one and a half. Um, shoot, my first few, <laughs> I've, I've gotten as, as big as the 13% returns on my, on my marketing pieces back in 2012. When was the last time you got a 13% return on a freaking mailer, right? Yeah. That's that it just doesn't happen anymore. However, the value is we understand dollar in dollar out, right? So even though it's only 1.5% on a yellow letter or you know 0.5% on a postcard, that's still 1.5% and 0.5. That's mm -hmm. still a return that you should be converting, right? So direct right. mail is still an area of of use for us um, and it's scalable. That's one of the nice things about direct mail. Cold calling is scalable as well, but it's much more difficult to scale that because you've got to have the staff and and and, and, bodies. and the bodies to actually yeah. hit those those phones. That being said, cold calling is another great tool. Uh, mm -hmm. Just hitting the phones. Door knocking is another great tool. Um, my my best answer to uh, the question of what should I do to market is to respond with a question of well, what will you do, right? The, there is the, there's a, a very, um, it's something that I've, I've been really, you know, knocking around a lot with my students and is, is there's a difference between should and would. We all have things that we should do, but what will you do? Do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Don't get so beat up about, well, I should be doing this. If you're not going to do that, stop beating yourself up about that and either find a staff member or a partner who will do that or find another road to get to the same results, yeah. something that you will do. So will you door knock? Door knock. Will you cold call? Cold call. Will you send mail? Send mail. Do whatever it takes. Uh, bandit signs. I'm not a fan of bandit signs because of the uh, code compliance issues uh, mm -hmm. that go along with bandit signs. Um, but whatever you will do, do it. All of the marketing tools that you've ever heard everybody else using, they work. 
I, so know, what's the message then that needs to be on that? So whether you're question. cold calling, direct so, calling. If you uh, show me a little ankle, I'll give you my, my tip here. <laughs> My, uh, my, I'm, I'm trying to negotiate on this. So here's my phrase. Here's the phrase that I don't typically give out to everybody, but why not? I'm going to give it out to a ton of listeners here. A phrase that I consistently get people responding to my marketing pieces for is that I can, well, actually I take that back. I'm not going to tell you my phrase. I'm going to tell you my thought process to my phrase because that teach Amanda fish, right? What is it that you can do as a sub to or creative financing buyer that Joe wholesaler can't do? Pay more. Pay more, right? So how can you put that in a phrase in your marketing collateral that's going to pop out in a way to your seller that makes them realize that you're the guy that can outbid everybody else by a significant margin? Mm -hmm. That's the thing that you need to be pushing out there. So I have a phrase that, and, and, and here's another tip. When you're sending out marketing of any sort uh, and you're getting those inbound leads and that kind of stuff, make it part of your lead intake form. So what made you decide to call me versus the other 10,000 pieces that are on your on your desk okay mm -hmm. um very quick question super valuable information you're gonna get from that so f about 95 percent of the people that respond to that question to me say this phrase well i just saw that you said blah 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 blah, blah. so therefore that is in all of my marketing now mm -hmm. right so that's the kind of value that you get from from asking these questions of well what made you decide to call me sometimes yeah. it's just well i just picked one <laughs> but, right but sometimes it's the phrase Hmm. So we're having some issues right now, some technical difficulties. All right, guys, sorry about that. Facebook was, it's got a little temperamental right now. So uh, let's go back to what you and I were just talking yeah. about. Uh, if you were, now that we've got these properties tied up mm -hmm. on these subject to deals with the mm -hmm. homeowners, how are you moving these properties? How are you finding buyers? Right. So the, um, in the interest of not knowing where it cut off, I'll just kind of repeat everything, right? So, right. <laughs> so uh, the, the guys that I know and myself included, uh, the majority of everything being sold right now, we're very fortunate to have tools like Facebook available to us, right? Mm -hmm. These Facebook groups, these Facebook ads. Uh, and I'm not really referring to like the boosted post kind of ad. I'm referring to like putting it up in the for sale, uh, like the marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be super valuable to you. The, 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 the vast, vast majority of properties that are being sold with owner financing right now are going through that channel. Um, Craigslist has kind of been killed because there's just... VA sitting over in, in India, just posting the same thing 14 times in a row. And you just, I mean, by 10 minutes after you post it, you're on page six, mm -hmm. uh, Facebook does a little bit better job for that. So that's going to be kind of that direct marketing stance of it. But to simplify that even one step further and, 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 and to really answer, uh, where I think most people should go. So here's a philosophy that I hold just kind of in general, right? Is pay everybody else for what they're good at until you can fire them later. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't, and similarly, don't not do a deal because of how much money somebody else is going to make on it. Right. Um, which applies in both what I'm about to talk to and like, if your wholesaler is going to make 30 grand off you, fine. If the number if is cool with you, the number is cool with you. You know right. what I mean? Like, yeah, I've don't never worry about cared. what other people don't worry about what other people are going to make. So similarly, what wh why that applies here is like hire a realtor, mm -hmm. hire a realtor. There's there's there are going to be realtors in your area who specialize in the seller financed sale. And they're going to have buyers in their pocket. I say gonna, I mean, I, I shouldn't ever speak in, in uh, certainties. There's likely uh, these people and they're going to have buyers in their pocket uh, and they're actively marketing to find more of these buyers. So a great way to find those guys is to start doing a little bit of reverse, of reverse marketing. Uh, go find properties that are for sale with owner financing and call them up and see, is that being sold through a realtor? Is that being sold directly from the seller? Is that being, like, how is that being sold? Where did you find that? And uh, and if it's the, a realtor selling it, say, hey, I actually have another property. Would you, uh, you know, I'm not interested in this one. I'm just trying to sell one. Do you, mm -hmm. would you be uh, willing to take that on? Uh, and they will. And that's gonna be a really good way for you to also find like, who's the attorney that's doing owner financed deals? Who's the title company that's doing owner financed deals? Who, how, where are they getting their disclosures from? That kind of stuff, reverse market. Find the owner financed deals that are for sale and, and talk to the seller. Mm -hmm. Interesting, that's a really good idea. So what does your organization look like then in order to run your operation? So I have two W2 employees and then anywhere depending on the season between like four and 10, uh, 1099 sales team members, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, not counting like the 
construction 1099 guys, but yeah. like the actual. So they're actively marketing to find sub two deals. Right. So one of my, historically speaking and, and, uh, and continually. So my, so I'm not a great lead gen guy. I just want to be very clear mm-hmm. on that. Like I, I, that's not my skill. My skill is that I convert deals. Um, I convert way more deals than, than most people do because we have different tools in our tool belt. Um, so my, uh, uh, lead gen is primarily through JVs. It's primarily through other folks that have a deal that may be a good owner finance deal. But as we all, I mean, there's just, there's just a, a trillion more turning gears on an owner finance deal than there is on a wholesale or a fix and flip or anything like that. So, uh, so people will bring me, Hey, I'd like to, you know, do you want a JV on this deal with me? And we'll take a look at it together and go through that way. Okay. So that's for, that's for, uh, finding properties. Right. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, were you talking about the sales side still? I'm uh, talking about acquisition, like finding yeah, yeah, yeah. two deals, right? Yeah. So, cause like a lot of these wholesalers, they got acquisition people, they got disposition people, right. and they got, uh, you know, cold callers. Right. Do you have these roles in your operation? So I, um, I have two salespeople, acquisitions team members that can mm-hmm. go on appointments to actually take the properties down at the appointment, right? Um, <clears throat> the, the disposition side, um, there's like four, four, four ish realtors, uh, that I use for, mm-hmm. for disposing of our properties, uh, uh, on that side. But then again, through kind of our, uh, the way that our operation goes, you know, that, that acquisitions team member in some ways is, is kind of that JV partner, mm-hmm. right? Like we, it's, it's whoever found that deal, uh, and is able to go out and contract and, and the way that we work that with people is like, basically, if we have to go out there and contract it, then you're just going to get a smaller cut of the deal. If you go out there and contract it, you get a bigger cut of the deal, right? So that's kind of how we handle that acquisitions team side of things. Gotcha. um, We've been using Infusionsoft um, as like from a CRM side of things to handle the team management of that, but we're pushing. It's courageous. Dude, it's, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very powerful tool that I pay a ton of money for and it doesn't work on mobile. Yeah. Yeah. Infusionsoft is a great, great theoretical program. (laughs) Right. Well, and it's good for, it's good for what it's good for. Right. But for the acquisition uh, side, uh, it's not. So we're, we're pushing over into uh, building everything out in Podio now to. Yeah. Podio is where it's at. Podio is, is amazing. Okay. So deal flow, like how many are you guys doing then? So I have to, I have to admit that I have unintentionally become a guru this year um, Mm -hmm. because I took such a heavy turn into the education side Mm -hmm. uh, that I let my acquisitions crap, go to crap. I'm Mm -hmm. I'm averaging a a deal or so a month. It's, it's, I'm not doing what I should be doing, but I just hired two people uh, within this last month because I was like, holy crap, why am I like, what happened to my deal flow? So we are, uh, we're pushing the marketing back out we there because the, 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 where I need to average, where I typically average when we are doing everything is between five and eight. Okay. Would you say you took a guy off the ball a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, and so here's the thing is like, what is the ball? Right. Mm-hmm. So one of the, the great, beautiful things about subject to, and what you can do through building this portfolio is that you build a portfolio. It's not a job, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, wholesaling is a job. Being a realtor is a job. It's a very high paying job, mm-hmm. but it's a job. Um, with subject twos and wraps, you're building a portfolio. You're you're not building a business. So I got to a stage where like, we're making money. I didn't need to buy a ton more. Like how much money do you really need? Right. And I found I'm super passionate about training. And quite frankly, I'm not as passionate about going on the appointments and buying the houses. I just, I'm, I'm just not. And right. so, um, about two years ago, I kind of made the decision to make an, an actual push into the education stuff. Uh, the beginning of last year is when I launched the the online academy for creativecashflow.com. And, uh, and we've seen a ton of successes from that. And I've loved doing it. And it's been great. And it's growing. Uh, so it's not necessarily that I took my eyes off the ball. It's just the ball changed for mm-hmm. me. And then I kind of realized like, oh, wait a minute. Like this... I, I need to be doing more volume over here. Um, right. If for no other reason than if I'm going to teach people to do it, like we need to be doing it, right? Yeah. The, um, but well, I think we all go through different seasons, right? Right. Like where we are in our career. So like how many properties then are you 
do you have in your portfolio? So I'm down to 30-ish right now. I've sold a bunch of notes over this last year. Um, I've done, so my personal portfolio, I've done about 150. Mm-hmm. Um, I've originated um, in, and made money on uh, and been on the HUDs of about four, uh, well, I'll put it that way. I've been on about 1,400 HUDs um, over my over my career in one way or another, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as like actually held in portfolio, uh, about 150 of those. All right. And uh, and so then whenever I split with Scott, you know, I was a 60% owner, he was a 40% owner, so 40% of the portfolio went to him, and then I've sold a bunch of notes and stuff too. Okay. Uh, Tang Win says that you are the uh, best rapper alive. <laughs> It's awfully generous. <laughs> Great title. That's awesome. I love uh, so are you in any other markets then? That's actually part of our push over this next 12 months is we are pushing into other markets now. Okay. So you started in Dallas? Mm-hmm. I've only ever been in Dallas. I've been okay. a big stickler of, of buying houses only in, in DFW. Okay. About half of my portfolio has been in Fort Worth. Half has been in Dallas. So what's changing? Why are you pushing? Um, so uh, lots of reasons. One being Dallas is just crazy pricing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Two being because of the education side that I'm doing, because of the fact that I'm like semi-public here and doing these things, I get a lot of people from other states and other cities that I would love to help, who would love to have me <laughs> help them, but I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I only buy in Dallas, right? And so I've had over this last two quarters kind of a realization of like, why am I not? Why am I not buying? Uh, you know, this is, so one of the things, there's a book that I really love. Uh, this book changed my, so if you're an owner operator, Uh, as in you're the guy going on the appointments, you're the girl going on the appointments, and you're not converting over 80% of your appointments, um, you need this book. Uh, The average, most people are going to convert 20 to 30%. Your acquisitions team, they're going to convert 20% or 25-ish percent of their appointments. Um, You, as an owner-operator, you should be converting 80 plus percent. Um, Part of that comes out of, well, lots of reasons. That's complete off topic. But there's a book called Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion, uh, and it's uh, it's it's a phenomenal book. Um, that book took me from being a 25% guy to an 88% guy uh, mm-hmm. on my conversion rates. What what it is is it's written by a, a PhD in psychology. His name's Robert Cialdini or Cialdini. I don't know. Cialdini. How to pronounce. Yeah. Is it Cialdini? Yeah. Okay. I finally know how to pronounce it. Thank you. <laughs> I always have to be like I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Cialdini. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and it basically goes through like, what are the things that make human brains make decisions, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the principles inside of there is that we, our brain takes shortcuts, right? Our brain is gonna make a decision and stick to that decision and just back up that decision. You saw an example of that in this show uh, earlier. It's like, what do you do about uh, reverse mortgages? I'm like, ah, I don't do them. Why not? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, but I know I don't do them. You know what I mean? Right. Like, because, we, uh, because you know, the, the brain takes about 800 calories a day mm-hmm. of, of effort. So from a very survivalistic instinct, our brain has decided if I've already made a decision before, I'm not gonna spend more calories to make that decision again. I'm just gonna have that shortcut that I made that decision, right? right? So long story long, what I'm getting at is I made that decision back in like 2013 that I was not gonna buy nationally. Well, it's not 2013 anymore, right? And Mm -hmm. so over this last two quarters, I've kind of had that realization of like, there's so many tools that we have that we can do remotely. There's so many people remotely that need help that are not closing deals because they don't have somebody who can JV with them on these things. Uh, and those are that's deal flow that I should be taking down. So yes, over this next twelve months, we will be doing a full national push to to every place else. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, monthly marketing. What are you spending on marketing? Uh, I've never spent a lot on marketing. And again, like I said, the the lead gen is is uh, never been my like superpower. But um, you know, marketing for for us is going to be anywhere between one and six thousand dollars a month. Okay. What about total overhead? Total overhead on a monthly basis. Uh, I'm I'm working at. Well, let's see, because I just hired two uh, two more people. So um, between twenty and thirty a month. Okay. Um, twenty thirty thousand in monthly overhead. Right. So How's that all going? So yeah. So um, well, and actually, that's a little bit outdated too. So I've got the employees, um, mm-hmm. and then I'd been pouring a lot of money into the education side of things. Gotcha. Uh, and then rent and uh uh just payments on houses and stuff that we, because we, you know we've got to budget out a certain amount for just vacancies and, mm. and holding costs and i'm including that in there that makes sense i was like man where is that going <laughs> yeah <So>. okay <laughs> strippers uh, and coke mostly but <laughs> hey you know what they need love too um uh, valuable resources um so valuable resources one i would throw out there would be like the propelio academy it's mm-hmm. a it's a free 
resource with tons of education from right. people that really know what they're doing. Uh, obviously, you know about this podcast. Continuing to look through the history and the library of uh, that's inside of this podcast is huge. Uh, but books, man, read books. Uh, you and I were talking about Traction. Traction is one of the – and Tang, you know, I got Tang on the Traction uh, book about a year ago. And everyone that I know that's picked up Traction and Rocket Fuel, the, the follow-up to Traction, everyone that I know that's picked up that book has just seen massive, massive results and changes in their business. And um, so I really, really, really cannot encourage you enough – to read traction. Yeah. Uh, and then influence is another very, uh, uh, influential book. Um, I'll just list off a few that I think you should read. Start with why is an mm -hmm. excellent book. Have you read start with why? Yep. Simon uh, Sinek. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a phenomenal book. And then, um, Oh, what's the other one I always recommend. That's kind of like start with why I can't remember it, but those are, those are a good starting point. Influence changed my, my life on conversions. Uh, uh traction changed my life on how we run our business. Mm -hmm. Um, and then start with why, it really opened my mind to a lot of different ways of how we were failing to serve our sellers, serve our buyers by making sure that we were aligning properly and that kind of stuff too. And that made a big difference for yeah. us. I mean, those are all great books. Influence, I actually just read this year. Oh, did you? Yeah. What'd you so, think of it? It was very interesting, right? Yeah. I mean, we kind of knew about social proof and right, stuff like right. that, but it was really interesting when he, when he broke down like, you know, that poor lady that was murdered in front of 38 people and why yeah. no one called yeah. the police. It was just very interesting. Yeah, it's Social insane phenomenon. how that stuff goes on. Um, Influence is one of those books that if you're a naturally good salesperson, you're gonna already inherently know everything that's in that book, mm. but as you're reading it, you're gonna go, oh, that's why that works. Well, not just that though. I, I like how he's using it as a defense mechanism. It's like, yes. if they're doing this, Tell them I don't appreciate you doing this to me right now, <laughs> and and end the conversation. So well, and the irony is that, and I'm sure you know this, but he actually wrote that book as a consumer protection book. He right. He, well, that's what it sounds like when yeah, you're reading it. He wrote that book to try and help consumers know how people are weaponizing influence. Mm -hmm and to combat it. Well, then he found out that the only people buying his book was us. <laughs> so he wrote <laughs> another book called Presuasion as yeah. a follow-up specifically to the marketer. And it's also very good, but I, I think that influence is where you should start. Uh, so going back to you're saying your why, so what is your why? Um, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So my why, I, I have to um, align my priorities as God, family, and everything else. Um, if I don't align in that way, I will, I'll find, like 2017, I spent six months in like a really deep depression, 2017, and I found out, or realized, it's because I had misaligned. Mm -hmm. I had I had my everything else above my God and family. I was working too hard and focusing on things that I shouldn't. So, so my why, I'm, I want to do this, it's the kind of the Dave Ramsey, live now like nobody else so you can live later like nobody else, right? I'll mm -hmm. work my butt off right now. Uh, let's build the portfolio right now. But it's so that I can spend time with my wife and my son and actually enjoy, you know, the latter part of our years. I, w I want to be able to, not saying that I will, but able to retire at 40 mm -hmm. uh, with complete, like, do whatever we want to do kind of portfolio. Um, that's not to say that I will stop working, but able to, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and but again, the point being so that I can spend more time with, uh, with loved ones and actually be outside and do stuff, not work. Cause I'm not that guy that like has to work. <laughs> yeah. I would prefer to do outdoorsy stuff with family. So that's, that's what this is all about for me is setting up a future for, for myself and my family and making sure that my son's going to be taken care of long-term. Awesome. What's your biggest struggle right now? Um, me, <laughs> if I'm going to be completely honest, you know, again, like I, I try to be a really open book about who I am and what's going on. And, um, uh, you know, similarly, like being an open book about like, I'm just not buying a bunch of houses right now. That's mm -hmm. just not where I'm at. Right. I'm not going to try and out guru people and be like, Oh yeah, well don't ask me, you know? So right now my biggest struggle is me. I've got a lot of failures. I've got a lot of, of weaknesses that I need to get around, uh, or staff around and, uh, and just in a mental space of trying to figure out what the best way is to, um, work around those shortcomings. Right. So, uh, an example being, I'm not a, like I said, I, you know, I, I can work. I will work. That's not my like default state. I don't want to hustle, grind, bust my butt. Like, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, the Facebook 
people want you all to believe that it's all about just oh hustle hustle hustle. I want to work smart. I don't want to hustle. I don't, I don't want to. I I work. I put in my time. I I worked my 15 hour days. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm kind of done with that. But we're in this transitional period where uh, the education stuff is taking off really well. Um, I'm a, I'm I'm loving how many people I'm able to help on that side. But I realized that the passion that I have for that. Um, the the real money is in the real estate, right? And I let my passion for the training and seeing other people succeed kind of overtake the acquisition side of things. Mm-hmm. So uh, so my failure in properly scaling both sides together uh, is something that right now is a tough season for me because I'm having to re kind of like, oh crap, I really focused a lot over here. And I love seeing the other people succeed, but it's not making me the money that right real estate makes, right? Mm-hmm. And so I've got to kind of like, like still push this ball because it's because again, you know, it's so important. I love Daniel Moore's quote of don't judge me by the millions I've made, judge me by the millionaires I've made. Mm-hmm. Um but rebuilding this acquisitions team up to where where we are getting that five to eight properties a month yeah. like we are used to having. Well and I got that same struggle too, right? Do so you? yeah, I mean for me, I love seeing other people succeed. Mm-hmm. Right. But I don't include myself in that. Right. And so yeah, and uh, so- I have to remind myself. And there's a book, uh, Give and Take, I think by Adam Grant. Okay. And he talks about like, you know, people that are too selfless mm-hmm. end up at the bottom mm-hmm. because they forget to take care of themselves too. I'm going to pick that up because that's very much something I'm struggling with right now. Is yeah. I've put so much emphasis and effort. Because like, for instance, the Propelio Academy that I, that I just, uh, I give away my whole module on seller financing that is a very expensive and very i spent a year in filming to get that thing that is a massive undertaking Mm -hmm. of putting this all together to put it out in front of people i gave it away for free because it's like yeah people deserve to have this knowledge and it's like well but wait a minute hold on (laughs) where's i should be you know so so it's uh it is it's it's a it's definitely i enjoy every bit of it but I've got to look at my entity as an entity and mm-hmm. I have to do the things that are going to make that entity grow. And that's the struggle I'm having right, right. with right now. Yeah. So I think the greatest lesson for me out of that book was like, yeah, you need to see other people succeed. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But you also need to make sure your wife and kids also succeed. Right. So yeah. take get, get rid of you mm-hmm. and think about your wife and your kids. Mm-hmm. So what is your superpower? Uh, my superpower is getting people on board. <laughs> my, my superpower is influence using the, using those tools that are in influence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a unique ability to sell, um, uh, and, and, and to get people on board with things and whether that's a seller getting on board with something or getting a group together to, to, to do something or, or building the acquisition teams or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's a practiced skill. That's one of those things where it's like you, uh, so rich dad, poor dad was, uh, was the first book I ever, it, it actually was like kind of what inspired me to get into real estate, which I think a lot of people share that, mm-hmm. that, uh, story. Um, one of the really, maybe the biggest thing that stuck out to me in that book, um, was his, have you read it? Rich dad, poor dad. Long time ago. Long time ago. There's a section where he's talking about like Michael Jordan wasn't the best bas- basketball player just cause he was the best basketball player, you know? Uh, to expand that, Peyton Manning, T- Tom Brady, these guys are naturally gifted, but they work at it. They mm-hmm. work at that craft. And and the thing that he used that to go into was like, so if you want to make money, get good at money, mm-hmm. right? And we can expand that even further. When I started my career, really the reason why I uh, – um, well, and, and now that I think about this, maybe I should have answered this in my in my initial struggles question – my initial initially i was a terrible negotiator i was terrified of getting in front of a seller and negotiating something uh had no idea what to do with that right that's what inspired me to do all the jving that i've done Mm -hmm. which was um you know to the point of well i'll just get all these other guys to go out and do the negotiating and i'll be their knowledge support right i'll i'll back them up because i've got the access to capital i've got the knowledge or the access to knowledge and they can go do the negotiating and then i was like well (laughs) Freaking sales are like these have been around f- for centuries. There's books, there's there's resources, there's that. So I studied it, right? And uh, and and in so in so doing in doing so, um, really found a passion for that side of things, right? I really enjoy the the negotiation and that kind of stuff. So uh, so I've taken that uh, very seriously and 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 enjoy doing that. And now uh, I'm in a position where I can share those same kind of tools with other people to help them grow in their negotiating and them get into a better spot of, yeah. uh, uh, of, of sales, because I think that's a common struggle that a lot of people have is the fear 
um, of sitting in front of a seller and trying to convince them to give you their house. All right. <laughs> um, going back on just a quick tangent, I'm talking about the, you know, Michael Jordan isn't the best because mm-hmm. he was just talented. Um, I like to tell some of the people that I'm training uh, the difference between Kobe Bryant and Darius Miles. Okay. So do you know who Darius Miles I is? I don't know who Darius Miles is. That's kind Miles. of the point. Okay. <laughs> so uh, they were both supposed to be the next Jordans. Okay. Uh, they were both baby Jordan. Like, you know, Darius Miles dunked on Charles Oakley in one of Jordan's camps. Really? Like he was this like, next superstar. Okay. And he got an NBA and all he did was smoke weed. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Kobe Bryant was killing himself, shooting 2,000 jumpers a day. Right. So yeah. they were both equally talented. Yeah. One did something with it. That's a great example. Wasn't his name Darius Miles? Darius Miles. He played for the Clippers for the longest time. Okay. Um, which is probably was the other reason why he probably failed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is the greatest lesson you have learned? Um, I think one, gosh, there's just so many lessons. One of the lessons that I think that I've learned that I think a lot of people need to hear right now is that sometimes the greatest deal you've done is the deal you didn't do. Um, I think right now people are super pressured into buying deals. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, you know what, here, I'm going to expand this even further into, into another big lesson that I think people need to understand. Um, don't focus on the number, your goal for your year should not be the number of houses you're going to do. It should be the dollar amount that you're going to receive from this. Right. Mm -hmm. So there it's a, it's a small distinction, but it's a very important one because, um, People come out and they say, oh, I want to buy 50 houses a year, which, by the way, you don't need 50 houses a year. Uh, People don't. We get so used to the big volume, big baller guys being on these podcasts and talking about, oh, I do 60 houses a year, you know, 120 last year or whatever that might be. I legitimately I can show you the numbers like you if everybody, if I ask you how much money do you want to have to to like retire on a monthly income? What do you want to have every month coming in passively so that you can retire? Everybody always says 10,000 bucks. Say, we can get you $10,000 a month for the rest of your life. And you have to own about 30 houses to get there. That's not, that's all you have. That's all you have to have. Um, It's, you get seller financed homes, you get a mixture of rentals in there and you're good, right? But this Facebook culture, this this Instagram culture, this uh, let me tout how many I'm doing and how good I am and blah, 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 puts this really unrealistic pressure on the new investor mm-hmm. to come in and say, well, I have to do 50, 60, 70 deals or I'm failing. That's not the case. And if you have a goal of I'm going to do 50 deals this year, you're going to take down some crap deals just to get deals under your belt. OK, is your goal to make money or is your goal to buy houses? Yeah. Your goal is to make money, I bet. I, I don't want to speak for you, but <laughs> but I would bet if you had the option of, hey, here's a bunch of money, here's a bunch of houses that are going to lose you money every year, mm-hmm. you'd probably take the bunch of money option, right? right? So make that your goal. How much equity do you need this year? How much cash flow is your goal for for uh, you know adding this year? And work towards those goals instead of working towards a volume goal. Yeah. So the dollar versus volume, I think, is a really important lesson that people need to understand. Because again, with the pressure to do volume, people are buying crap deals. And and that's scary. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting, because I have a slightly different- You have a, a different view on slightly that. Slightly different view on okay. it, right? So what's I, your take? Well, I think the, the volume, right? Mm-hmm. And given the volume, mm-hmm. you work backwards, figure out how many deals you need to do. Because- Wait, the volume work backwards. Wait, can you say that again? Depending on the sales, how much money you want to make. Right. Figure out how many yes. deals you need to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah. make that number, right? Mm-hmm. I agree with you. Don't take bad deals. Sure. <laughs> Saying no will sometimes save you a lot of money. Oh yeah. Uh, but if you don't have a units, mm-hmm. it's hard to repeat. It's hard to repeat. If you know how many, what it takes to do units, right? Mm-hmm. You got to work backwards. Mm-hmm. But I agree. Don't go after number. Right. Just go after number. Go after right. number because there's a reason. Right. Behind that number. Yeah, I I absolutely agree with that. A quick anecdote, kind of on that note, of uh, of this, you know, your 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 best deal may be the one you say no to. Uh, also, if you are studying and you are saying no to a bunch of deals, stay strong (laughs) because that can get really discouraging too. When you're seeing a bunch of deals and you just constantly are like, no, 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 no. You're like, what the hell am I even doing? Like, I can't buy anything. Why is this guy buying? So in my old neighborhood, there was a house that I made a run at. Um, I ended up saying, or saying no, because I got outbid. 
by somebody else. But I lived in that neighborhood. So I had to come home every day and see them rehabbing it and making it look beautiful. It went up on the market. It ended up selling for, you know, this great price. And I'm just like, I just don't understand what did they know that I didn't know? Like what? And that's I hear that all the time. I don't know if you hear that from people, Mm -hmm. too, but it's just like, what are what do these other people know that I don't know? Why are they able to buy these houses? Fast forward a couple of years. And uh, cause, so like when I do personal mentoring, I always do an interview beforehand and I, and I don't take everybody on. And I was telling this lady I wasn't going to take her on for, for other reasons. And she's like begging me to, to take her on in my course or in my personal mentoring. And then she, to get me to accept her, she starts telling me about this story about how she lost $75,000 on this deal. And, you know, she bought it and she did this beautiful rehab, but then this and this and this and this and this. And well, it comes, it was that house, <laughs> right? Yeah. So don't always wonder what that person knows that you don't, even if you see somebody else bid it. There's a lot of people losing a lot of money in real estate right now, but nobody's posting that on Facebook. Right. You know, I can, I can show you HUDs where, You've got a, 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 you know, whatever, $50,000 payout to the seller, but you lost 10,000 bucks on the deal. Don't pay attention to the check that people like to throw up on their Facebook thing. Mm-hmm. They might have lost money on that deal. That check means nothing. Until I see a PL, I don't believe crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, when are people going to start posting their PLs on Facebook? <laughs> right, exactly. It's uh, not as sexy. <laughs> so, what's your favorite, best, or most interesting failure? Um, I think, yeah, so. The uh, I don't know if I have any favorite failures. So here's here's the thing. Um, that's always a really difficult question for me because I have a difficult time like defining things as failures uh-huh. for myself. Um, and part of that's hubris, but I think part of that is also was it uh, was it Edison or Einstein that was like I didn't fa- I f- I found ten you know ten thousand ways not to do it. Edison. Edison. Um, and I'm butchering the quote, I know, but the, but the, but the point being your failures are successes in their own right. Mm -hmm. And to have the, um, motivation to stay in this business long term, you have to convince yourself to have that kind of viewpoint. right? Right. Um, because this has a huge turnover rate. Real estate does people get in and out. I would say 95 plus percent of the people that get into real estate leave within six to six months. Um, it is a massive turnover. It's a brutal business. It is. It's the, you know, I used to think traditional real estate, you know, just regular realtors. I, I always say, you know, I love that because I, I love this industry because it's the most capitalistic industry there is. Like mm-hmm. if you don't kill, you don't eat. Right. 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 Um, man, wholesaling and this other off market stuff is way more brutal, <laughs> but way more capitalistic, way more, right. I don't know, like I want to say animalistic, but mm-hmm. I mean, it is a brutal industry. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of great people in it. Oh yeah. But if you don't have like, thick skin and and and, and uh, a lot of grit, mm-hmm. a lot of persistence, man, you're gonna get chewed up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you really are. And to add to that, proper expectations. Yeah. I think improper expectations are the number one killer of investors. Um, I think people again say, oh well, so and so. Like you know, like I said, my within eight months, I was averaging seven or eight houses a month. Mm-hmm. That's not what happens. <laughs> That's a right. very, very edge case use. That is a guy uh, that you, you know. I, I, I was just very lucky. I got I got plugged in with the right people. God opened a lot of doors for me, and it and it took off. That's maybe one in a trillion cases that mm-hmm. that happens, right? But I'm but I'm here, and we're gonna have hundreds or thousands of people that hear that and say, oh, so you're going to get all these houses within the first six months. That's what we're going to do. It's not what you're going to do. I can almost guarantee you it's going to take you eight or nine months to get any kind of traction at all. To buy a house is probably going to be within that six to nine month range. To get consistency is probably going to be in that 12 to 15 month range, right? But people get in and they have this improper expectation and then they start viewing their failures as failures instead of just bumps along the road to get to that ultimate goal. Uh, and it causes people to, to leave. So um, so it's hard for me to answer what is my best or favorite or whatever failure because because I can never think of failures, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's just, A, I've been very, very fortunate in, uh, in my career and, and the business. I, I hadn't, um, I, I don't think I've ever lost more than two or $3,000 on a deal. And I mm-hmm. think I've done that maybe twice. Um, one of which I very much knew was going to happen when I went in. It was like, ah, I'm either going to make $13,000 or I'm going to lose two. And yeah. I lost two. And I'm like, oh, well, whatever. <laughs> um, all right. So 
real quick, guys, we're still giving shirts away. So follow me on Instagram. Look for a post about 10 to 14 days old. I'll have instructions there on how to get these free Real Estate Disruptors t-shirts. Uh, and then join me tomorrow at 2 o'clock uh, Pacific, 5 o'clock Eastern. Octavius, Bennett, and Nick Lovano are coming in from LA. They're going to talk about how they did their first million in wholesale fees. Uh, so going back to you, uh, what are your last thoughts? Anything you want to leave the listeners with? Um, just some encouragement to, to really expand your knowledge now because as markets shift, um, all it's taken to be a good real estate investor for this past four years is time. Uh, you can be a crap investor, buy a deal and wait six months and look like a genius. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not going to stay, right? So when that market shifts, the people who already know how to handle that market um, are going to be the ones that succeed. The people who don't are going to be the ones that you meet at Home Depot that say, you know, that are employees that say, oh, I used to be in real estate. And then the crash of 2000 or of 2020 happened. And yeah, you know me, you know what I mean? Right. How many of those people have we met? We've Everybody's met that guy that mm-hmm. got out in 2008 or whenever. Um, so even if you are not going to take the creative strategies to your own portfolio, because there's such value in focus, there's such value in, in knowing your niche and staying inside of it. But but, but my encouragement is to widen that and not say I'm a wholesaler or I'm a fix and flipper and to say I'm a single family investor, right? I need to have the different tools in my tool belt to at least recognize when a deal may qualify for one thing or another so I can work with somebody else who knows how to do that stuff. Uh, like th- there's a, what's his, a cash flow, Chris, and, and what's his partner's name? Uh, the AZ Flip guys, Brian. Uh, do you JV with guys on, on deals? 100%. Okay. So you have resources here locally uh, and and nationally uh, that you can reach out to of people that are successful and know how to take down those deals. You need to recognize that even if it doesn't look like a deal for a wholesale, uh, there's certain things, certain qualifications that can make it a deal for creative financing. And the creative financing world, the sub two world is gangbusters in a, in a down market. That is when we really shine. That is when yeah. you build your portfolio. So get ready for that now. I'm not a sky is falling guy. I'm not worried about it, but get ready now so that when that crash happens, you're prepared to take it. Right, you're down. not saying it's gonna happen this year or right. next year. It's just gonna happen at some it's point. It's going to, yes. All right. So gotcha. Perfect. By, by preparing now, uh, you're setting yourself up for that long-term success. Awesome. If someone wants to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Uh, so you can reach out to me at creativecashflow.com. Uh, I've got a contact on there, or you can hit me on Facebook. Uh, you know, Grant Kemp. I'm, I'm sure I'll be tagged on here <laughs> somewhere right. that you can get to me that way. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to chat with you. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you for watching, and thank you. Thanks, Steve. That was a lot of awesome information. Yeah. Appreciate it, man.